That's a bit noisy. Thank you very much, Anne Claire. Have you ever been listening to someone speak and you sort of think to yourself, yeah, I know all of that, and you sort of half tune out, only to find out a bit later that you really didn't know it all? Because when people start talking about what's happened, you think, oh, I didn't know this, I didn't know that, I missed something. Sometimes I think when we look at the word of God, sometimes something like that can happen to us as well. I know it can happen with me. I was reading the word of God recently and I suddenly realised that perhaps the way I was looking at the word of God wasn't what God was really saying. And so I'd just like to start, I've titled my message today, I've entitled it Inspired by God's Love. And I'd like to start by reading a scripture from Matthew. It's Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 50. Uh, if we can bring that up. If not, I'll just read it. Oops, I've creased my Bible again. Okay, here we go. And this is Jesus talking about, talking as he often did with parables. And he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Again, says Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught every kind of fish. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand these things? The disciples said we do. Now look, I've often read this scripture that says the kingdom of God is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in the field. And in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned that he had enough money to buy the field. And my thinking used to go along the line, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Getting the kingdom of God is worth everything. It's worth everything we can give. And so it is. In that sense, it's absolutely true. Being in the kingdom of God is worth everything. There is nothing that can buy it. It's worth everything. But I started to ponder this scripture and I started to think about it and I realised that there's more to this scripture than what is just on the surface. At least to me it was. It was my little revelation perhaps that probably 10,000 people have had before me. I don't know. But as I began to think about the scripture, I began to realise that God is not necessarily talking about us getting into the kingdom here. You might remember if you look at, um, well I'll put it this way. Maybe this is just me. Why not take something simple and turn it into something complicated? Might as well miss, may not miss the opportunity. <laughs> I tried something like this with one of my kids once. I said to the, the child, you know, why settle for being difficult? Put some effort into it. You can be impossible. <laughs> I don't suggest you do that. The child might take you up on it. <laughs> but in Scripture, we see that the field is often referred to as the world. Jesus often refers to the field field as the world. In Matthew chapter 9 verses 37 to 38 and you can look it up later but Jesus is talking about labourers going into the field and he's saying that we should because he says the fields are white to harvest but Jesus says pray that the Lord of the harvest will send labourers into the field. The field of course is the world and, and if I just read another scripture to you out of Matthew chapter 13 I haven't put it up on the 
the overhead, but I'll just read this part of it to you. It starts at verse 24. And this is yet another parable that Jesus told. It's called the parable of the wheat and weeds. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, the enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted the good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer explained. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles and burn them, and put the wheat into the barn. Now later on, Jesus' disciples came to him and they asked him, they said, what does this mean? And in verse 37, uh, Jesus gave an explanation. Jesus said, the son of man is the farmer. The son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world. It's the world full of people. The good seed represents the people of the kingdom, those that have given their hearts to the Lord, those who follow God. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one, the enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the harvesters are the angels. The thing I wanted to point out from here and it seems to be consistent through what Jesus had to say is that in the scripture which I read to you initially from Matthew 13 verses 44 the man that seemed to me to be that God was talking about there is not you or me but it's talking about Jesus the son of man. It's talking about him. The field is the world, right? And just like the good seed were believers in the scripture we just read, the treasure is you and me. The same when it's talking about the pearl. The treasure is you and me. So what is happening here is with my understanding of this now is that God... is the one searching in the field. He found the treasure in the field. The treasure was you and me. And God was willing to pay the price to get it. We could never pay the price. We could never pay the price to get into heaven. The price is far too high. So God came and God is going to pay the price for the treasure that is in the earth. And that treasure cannot be bought with things that are material. We cannot. God can create gold. God can create silver. No troubles at all. He created the universe without any trouble. It's an amazing thing about God. I have trouble understanding how God can create something like massive as the universe and not be diminished in his power or ability to create in any way. He didn't lose anything. It's beyond my comprehension. I'm a rational person. It's just not rational. My wife knows I'm a rational person. <laughs> Being rational is different sometimes. You know, not everybody relates to it. I found that out in this modern world. <laughs> so I have a lot of trouble understanding what some people believe. It doesn't seem rational to me. But anyway, that's, the, that's another story. But the thing I wanted to get across here and what really hit me about this scripture was that God was the one who was looking for treasure in the world. God is the one who is looking for an inheritance for Jesus. God is the one who wants a bride for his son Jesus. And the treasure he's looking for is you and me. And the price that he is prepared to pay is far beyond what anything could be paid. Because it can't be bought with silver and gold it was bought and paid for by Jesus by the only begotten son of God something that was never made that is the price that God was prepared to pay for people to come into his kingdom that was the price that Jesus was prepared to give of himself to leave glory in heaven someone who is God in himself and come down and seek out 
you and me. Because you, know, you and me, he saw treasure. He saw something that he wanted because God, from the very beginning when he created us, created us for a relationship with himself. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to know you. He wants to fellowship with you. It's important to him. And you can see how important it is to him. He was prepared to give beyond anything that we could imagine. He was prepared to give of his very, very, very best to have a relationship with you, to have a relationship with me, to have a family, to have the bride of Christ, if you like. And that's what hit me about this scripture, that God loves us so much that he was prepared to give everything. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying to us today. The kingdom of God, God wants you in his kingdom. John 3.16 that makes it plain to us, doesn't it, in a way? Because what does John 3.16 say? We all know what it says. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The only begotten son. Not something that's made. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Very simple scripture. We quote it often and often and often. But do we realise that the, the level of what God has given, there's nothing more that he could give for you or for me. Interesting thing about treasure, of course, if it's buried in a field, it's been sitting there long enough, maybe someone's wrapped it up in some sort of cloth or something, but when you dig it up, it's probably going to be covered with all kinds of muck, rubbish, dirt, whatever you want to think of. It's going to need cleaning up. The muck's got to be got rid of. So you've got this nice shiny treasure. Yeah. I used to love to collect old coins once. And, you know, you're looking for those that are perfect, spot on, that have no wear, no, no nothing. Hard to get. And... Uh, you know, people still treasure these things, the old things like that. But you see, God wants his treasure cleaned up. So when we come to God, when he digs up the treasure, we are covered in muck. We're covered in sin. And God wants to clean that sin up. God wants to turn us into sons and daughters of the living God. Those whose character represents, reflects him. So it's not a case of God just wanting to search out the treasure and say, ah, oh, look, I found this treasure. It's a case of God wanting to take that treasure and clean it up and have it looking perfect because God wants a spotless bride. So God doesn't just give of his son the best that he's got, but God then wants to work in your life and in my life to conform us to his, the image of his son. God has a plan. The plan of redemption is such that it's not just, oh, I've been saved. It's not just that at all. The plan is to turn you into the sons and daughters of God who reflect God's image and his likeness. So God is working to do that as well. You see, God loves you so much this is so great that he was prepared to give the best that he had. If the price to enter a heaven is high, then you can see the price that Jesus paid for the whole world. Do you see how much God loves you? Do you see how much, how much importance God places upon you? Do you see how significant you are in the kingdom of God? You are not some nobody. Look around you. Look at the people around you. These are people that God loves and values such that he would give his only son, such that he would seek you out. Think about Mounties Church down the road. These are people 
that God loves and values. Think about the church across the road here, the Indonesian church. These are people that God loves and values. You know, I was just in this last week, I spoke to a couple of people. I, they had T-shirts on, and I won't say what they had written on their T-shirts, but they indicated they were Christians and they were making a loud statement about it. I don't object to that. So I thought that, you know, I'll, have, I'll start a conversation with these people. But the conversation didn't get very far. It was a sort of a monologue because they wanted to tell me about what they believed and were dogmatic about it. But there was no, how can I put it, and I don't want to be critical, but there was no love in stating that. It was, you know, this is what I think. And I couldn't really enter the conversation. I only say this because, because we have to learn to accommodate one another. You know, we don't have to focus on small things. We need to focus on Jesus. We need to focus on our relationship with him. That is the most important thing. There's nothing more important than that. Small things of doctrine do not have to become big issues in our life. We could talk about them sometimes, but they're not issues where we have to win an argument. Jesus is the one that we need to focus on. And he put value upon each and every one of us as Christians. He put his love upon each and every one of us. So when I just said, look around the room or look at other churches, but hey, what about your family? Does Jesus value them? What about your friends? Does Jesus value them? Are they treasure in the field waiting to be discovered? What about your co-workers? Not all co-workers are easy to get on with. But that doesn't make them bad. Sometimes the difficult people are, you get more out of. Ah, they treasure waiting to be found. Are they? Hmm. What about your acquaintances? Are they people who God loves and values? Are they worth sharing the word of God with? Because somewhere along the line, someone shared the word of God with you, whether you grew up in a Christian family or not. Someone has shared the word of God. Someone put value on you. Look, when I was young and I knew it all and I knew how to deal with everything and I knew right from wrong and I could tell my parents, well, what, not really my parents, but it doesn't matter, but I could tell them what to do, you know, and explain to them how their life should be led. And then I became a Christian one day at 23 and I should have known better and I went home to visit my father. And I walked in the door full of self-righteousness and I said to him, the only reason I'm here is because I'm a Christian. You wouldn't have seen me again otherwise. That was ouch. It kind of shows you the amount of muck I had on my life still. You see? I hadn't learnt the significance of what God had done for me. I hadn't learnt to behave in a way that I should. I hadn't realised that even though I didn't like my family and they didn't really like me that much at that point, I hadn't learnt and God showed me later on that they are just as valuable as anyone else and they have just as much right to be in the kingdom as anybody else. And who am I to try and withhold that information from them? Yes, it brings tears to my eyes that day. It's like I'm ashamed of what I did. Well, I don't like sharing my shame like that. But the point is this, that we have, an inf we have within us, and I fail to do this so often, the word of life because God has shed his love abroad in our hearts and he wants us to do the same. If he values you and he values me and he loves you and he loves me as much as to send his only begotten son to seek us out, 
then we are now his hands and feet. We are the ones that God has called to do the work. You know, let's value others. Let's love others. Let's, I cannot say that this heart have enough, emphasize it enough. Let's be inspired by the love that God has shown us. Let's be inspired to take up the call that God placed upon our lives. Let's be inspired to make a difference in this world. God doesn't have anyone else. Who does he have? He has no one else. Are you, am I, inspired to fulfill and respond to the call of God upon our life? Are we inspired because of what God has done in his love to make a difference in our family, in our, with our workmates? Mm. You might ask me, did I ever share the gospel with my father? Yes, I did. Hopefully he came to the Lord. You know, it was difficult sharing with him. But the point is this. Just because you may not get on with somebody does not mean that we can, should withhold what God has so kindly done for us. And I know that sometimes it's difficult. But God didn't say life was going to be easy. He didn't say, I'm going to make life heaven for you on earth. He didn't say that, but he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will always be with you. In Mark chapter 12, verses 30 to 31, we read where Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbour as yourself. Do you see that point of love from God? Yes, we are to love God, but we are to love people. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. I like this chapter. I haven't put it up there, but obedience to God is more important than any sacrifice we do. We need to be obedient. Jesus, sitting talking to his disciples, said, you are my friends if you obey me. And that was while he was here on earth. Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father. All things are under his control. So much more should our obedience to God's word be. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, and I'll just read these to you in closing. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I have a question this morning. I have a question for myself. Am I prepared? Are we prepared to put our hands to the plough and not look back? Are we prepared to give of ourselves in obedience to God, understanding how much God has given for us? He didn't withhold. Are we prepared not to withhold also from him? I think it's a sad indictment sometime in the Christian world and I take blame myself for this, that we really do not share what we have. But God is looking for treasure in the earth. God is looking for the pearl of great price. And at the end, God will come. And just like we spoke about the fish, he will separate those who believe from those who don't. We're in the kingdom where there will be love, joy, peace, hope, all of these things. But for those who don't know, or those who 
And, and for those who deliberately reject, well, that's their choice. But for those who don't know, there's no love, there's no joy, there's no hope, there's no peace. There's perpetual torment. I don't think any of us would like to be part of that. Can I encourage you? The fields are white to harvest. God wants to bring in a great harvest. Let us be the people that make a difference in bringing this to pass. Amen? Amen. Father, I just want to thank you that you have been so kind to us and so generous to us and you have blessed us in everything that we have. Father, I just pray that you would inspire us by your Holy Spirit to go into this world and to make a difference in the lives of many other people. Father, we just commit ourselves to you now in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.